Shall we begin? Hi, well, look, welcome uh, everybody to this webinar that's introducing four key programs from the School of Social Sciences at the University of Waikato. I'm just going to begin by making a few comments about social science before uh, introducing who's up here. And, and then each of us is going to speak for about 10 minutes on the subjects that we are covering to give you a sense of what you need to know uh, and what you can expect when studying uh, politics, geography, philosophy, and sociology and social policy here at Waikato this semester. So we are part of the School of Social Sciences, and social sciences uh, is that part of science that deals with humanity and its social aspects. And the goal of social sciences is really to help understand and explain how society works. So, you know, in a COVID-19 context, for example, it might involve researching things like, why have some countries responded better to COVID-19 and the lockdown requirements than others? Um, why, are some, why are some populations more compliant with regulations to lockdown than others? And what are the impacts of social isolation associated with lockdown on specific groups like the elderly who may be less technologically literate or children and young people? Or why are some groups more likely to uh, become infected with poor and marginalised groups? And of course, there are other traditional questions associated with the social sciences. Um, what leads to social well-being? Why do people vote and how do they vote in elections? Um, why are some populations more likely to be imprisoned than others? And what makes people happy? So the social sciences is that part of the university that provides vital information on these kinds of issues for government, policy makers and others. And so sitting here, we have uh, a group of social scientists. Uh, we have Lars Brayburn from geography, we have Dan Weyer from philosophy, and Juan Tovey from sociology and social policy. And we are each going to run through what you can expect when studying geography, philosophy, uh, sociology and social policy, and political science and public policy here at Waikato. Uh, this semester. Um, so we each have about 10 minutes, and after these 10 minute presentations, you'll we'll be able to respond to any questions you have. So you can ask these questions via the chat function on Zoom. Uh, so just go in and type a question as it pops into your head, um, type it in as we're running through, um, and um, It'll be recorded and we'll come back to those questions at the end. So is that okay by way of introduction, guys? Yeah, yes, thanks. good. Cool. So I'm going to begin, and I'm going to begin by making a few comments about studying political science and public policy here at Waikato. Um, what we offer and what you can expect from taking our papers. So political science. Political science is the study of power and of government um, locally, nationally and internationally. So it involves things like the study of our democracy in New Zealand and we're one of the world's oldest democracies. Uh, we were the first country to give women the vote and by and large we're recognised as a reasonably robust democracy. And those of us who teach and research on politics in New Zealand generally of the view that we can't take that for granted. So we ask questions that will contribute to trying to improve and strengthen democracy in New Zealand. And globally, we see other countries are grappling with a loss of trust in their political systems, um, a loss of trust in their media. And this at a time when you know, the world is facing these significant challenges of um, sort of COVID-19. Thank you, Dean. Um, Catch up with the slides, guys. Um, most, um, and this happening at a time when we are dealing with some of the, well, with significant and major issues. Um, COVID-19, 
climate change, environmental degradation, uh, and you know, a, a new awareness of deep and institutionalized racism through the likes of the Black Lives Matter. Now, most of us don't get to study these kinds of issues until we come, to, or most of us don't get to study these kinds of issues through a politics lens until we get to university. I don't think we do very well at dealing with civics and political literacy in our secondary school system. And it's not until our students take a paper at university that uh, they get to focus closely on these issues as political issues. And what studying politics does is it increases our capacity to uh, engage with these most important issues of our time and you know, contribute to making change in the world. So a politics degree gives you a good foundation in knowing and understanding what citizenship means, um, how our system of government works, how laws are made, the roles of formal institutions like parliament and the cabinet and the media, and you know, common civic activities like voting. Um, so studying politics helps you to develop the knowledge and skills to be an active citizen who's able to participate effectively in your community. And you know, how are we doing as a country on this front? Well, we know from a 2019 survey that was carried out by Seed Waikato here in Hamilton, that's a group of young active Hamilton citizens, that two out of five young Hamiltonians didn't know how to vote in the local government elections last year. And eight out of 10 felt quite disconnected from local government. So those of us who study and teach political science are generally interested in you know, being a part of the solution to these kinds of issues. Um, and you can think of studying politics at one level as you know, providing an advanced civics education. So those of us who research and who teach politics at White Cato uh, are made up of a group of researchers who, who do things like study environmental politics and policy, climate change, um, international relations, gender and ethnic politics, um, political communication in the media, uh, corruption in politics, how we can deepen uh, our democracy and increase participation. And we have the whole security studies field as well. So we look at international security issues, cyber security. And we have staff who research in um, different comparative politics. So politics of Southeast Asia or South America. And as a group of researchers, we ask questions like, why are some countries responding more effectively to COVID? What lessons can we learn from other countries? Uh, and how, how might we more effectively respond to international crises like climate change? And why is democracy surviving in some countries but becoming weaker in others? So, our teaching on these kinds of questions is informed by up-to-date research on the latest scholarship issues. So you can um, study politics as a major, as either a BA or a VSOC sign. Uh, and in a politics major, you can focus on the international relations stream, which looks at um, you know, New Zealand's relationships with other countries, uh, our foreign policy, uh, our links with international organizations like the UN and NATO. So you can study that as a stream within a political science major, but you can also study that as a minor, which involves taking 60 points and in specified international relations paper. 
And you can do the same thing with public policy. Um, so you know, public policy, that's the study of the development and implementation of policy. It's a kind of a fine grained look at politics and the politics of policy making as it relates to specific issues, like for example, um, health policy or housing policy. And the focus on public policy gives you uh, the skills and knowledge to deal with government in your future profession, or to work with in government, or to lobby government as part of an advocacy group. Um, in the B semester, or B trimester, as we're calling it now, this year we're offering two level one papers. Uh, the first is Polls 102, New Zealand Politics and Policy. This is an introduction to um, how government works in New Zealand, um, how decisions are made, and we cover contemporary policy uh, issues. We're also offering via NET uh, an introduction to uh, international relations, which looks at um, case studies, theories of international relations and contemporary developments in the study of world politics. At level two, we have four interesting papers and there are no prerequisites for these. So we are offering a paper on terrorism in the state, uh, a paper on political systems around the world. We're offering a paper on US politics, which is particularly, which will be interesting given the US presidential elections coming up in November. And we all, all are also offering a paper on the politics of collective memory. I'm the convener of political science and public policy, so if you have queries about your undergraduate program, don't hesitate to get in touch. And I'll just finish with one final thought. Um, young people are playing a critical role and some of the biggest issues of our time, think about the school strike for climate, think about the role of young people stepping forward in the Black Lives Matter movement. And studying politics as a way of becoming more effective in these kinds of activities. Uh, to, know how to, to know how influence happens and how to be effective in promoting change. And, we have got an election in September. It's a great time to study politics. We're not really here to sell you our programs, but um, we're really here to give you information. But let me finish with the sales pitch. It's a great time to study politics, guys. <laughs> um, so um, that's me on political science and public policy here at Waikato. If you have any questions, I can see heaps of questions up there. Um, we can come back to those later, but for now, Lars, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thanks Patrick. It's also a, a great time to, to study geography. Um, I just to point out at the start, I mean, this panel is made up of all uh, males, but actually in our um, school, we actually have uh, a lot of uh, female lecturers. There's actually probably more than 50% of our staff uh, are women. So, so don't, don't get it. Um, uh, a false represent, uh, a false sense of what, what we're about based on this panel. Okay, so geography um, covers a broad range of topics, and I guess that's what we see as our strength, is, is that broadness. We think it's, it's really important that geographers uh, are able to communicate with a range of professionals, political scientists, uh, philosophers, sociologists, but also a lot of uh, physical geographers, hydrologists, scientists, computer scientists, and so on. Uh, because a lot of the problems facing this world are complex. If, if they were simple to, to resolve and to come up with solutions, uh, then they would have, they would have been uh, fixed already. So a lot of these, these problems um, uh, get debated for, for years and uh, people are thinking of solutions uh, to them. So it's common for a geographer to be working in a regional council or a local council and working with people from a range of backgrounds. And so we, in geography, think that it's really important that you have uh, a broad uh, understanding of a range of topics. I mean, let's face it, you know, the world is rapidly changing and uh, COVID-19 has reminded us of that. And uh, to resolve these, these problems, yeah, we do need to have, have a broad understanding 
But before COVID, you know, we've had you know climate change. This is this is going to be with us for a long time. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of issues with uh, water quality, and I mean these these issues are not simple to resolve. They, they involve both understanding the environment, but also understanding uh, uh, land use, a um, uh, lot of the, the sort of physical side of stuff in terms of hydrology and, and fertilizers. But also you need to think about people's livelihoods. Um, and, 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 and jobs and, and economics. So that's what we think is, is really important that uh, students graduate with a broad uh, range of, of topics that they understand and uh, geography um, tries to achieve that. So it's really important that you, you know, people understand a lot of environmental issues. Uh, and, and, and the key concepts are social with, with the environment, but you also need to look at social social issues such as jobs, um, identity, um, and, and well-being, and so on. And also look at cultural issues um, and economic uh, issues. So it's, that, it's getting a, a, a broad perspective and being able to talk to people and be part of a team that looks at these uh, issues where we make uh, progress. It's also really important that um, you have people that can understand both the physical environment as well as, as the human environment. So geography tries to, to bridge, bridge that. And so we're one of the, the few disciplines that are actually achieving that. Um, and it's, it's really important that you're able to um, apply this knowledge to a wide range of issues. It's not just climate change, it's not just COVID, it's not just crime. Um, you don't know what the future is going to bring, and you don't know how your job is going to change over, over the future. I mean, you think of the people employed in tourism at the moment, um, suddenly they have to think about uh, other jobs. I mean, the government's setting up a lot of jobs in terms of uh, job creation. So uh, I just was talking to a geographer yesterday who was responsible for the $100 million fund for um, fencing our streams. So it's a pretty exciting job, but that involves quite a, um, a broad range of knowledge. You need to be able to do mapping, you need to be able to work with uh, quantitative data, you need to be able to talk to farmers. You're also talking to a lot of regional councils, uh, politicians and so on. So uh, geography does lead to a lot of interesting jobs. And you should be, when you're planning your degree, you should be thinking about um, being able to be flexible for this changing world <coughs> and uh, you know, deal with what the, the issues that are going to arise. So here's a graph, it's a bit of a confusing graph, but it shows um, um, those uh, in, um, that geographers, it shows that geographers, are the, um, so the actual graph shows percentage of graduates is not in employment, right? So it's not in employment. So actually low is good. And so you see uh, geographers are the, the green line there, they're the lowest. So the, the dark black line is, is uh, all of um, social science. Uh, by the green line, you can see that uh, the geographers um, are most likely to be employed. And I think that's due to being having that broad discipline base. Okay, oops, just a little bit far there. Um, so you need to be, this might be uh, that chart there on, on the right might be familiar to you. You need to be able to plan your degree. And uh, so geography, you take two papers at stage one, three at uh, stage two, and um, four at um, stage three. Uh, so um, this year we've, we've had the Environment and Society uh, paper that was taught in the A semester, and so in the B semester we've got people in place. So these first year papers are very broad in scope uh, to cover this uh, broad range of, of topics. Um, and then you'll see uh, in the second year, you've, you've got a lot of choice there. So you can look at, uh, we include anthropology, we include environmental planning, and we also um, include population studies. So we've designed the degree so that you've got a lot of flexibility and you get a broad uh, coverage of different subjects. Uh, and in the third year, we're sort of showing our, our specialization that we have in this particular program. You've got, we've got environmental planning, but we've got disasters and development. We've got uh, gender, gender, place, and culture. So we've got a, quite a strong uh, feminist geography stream um, here at Waikato. We've got indigenous geography, so we're quite strong in, in indigenous uh, geographies here. And we also got uh, GIS, which is which is uh, mapping and uh, uh, presenting a lot of uh, 
คนไทยถูกด่าได้ So there was a, there was a major in geography. We also have a minor in uh, GIS, geographical information systems, which is what I'm involved in. Uh, so this can be part of any degree that you want. Um, so you get an opportunity to be minors uh, with your degree. And you'll see that this is a, a mix of uh, statistics, uh, computer science, as well as um, cartography and uh, geographical information systems. So there are lots of jobs uh, mapping. Uh, so like you see with COVID, there was lots of maps that you would have seen. I actually got involved uh, with the DHB during the um, health health um, emergency. Uh, they wanted uh, someone to map maps where all the COVID cases were and where the immunisation was. So this is, GIS is quite an uh, important school. Uh, it's used a lot by different councils. So that's me. I'll now hand you over to Dan to talk about philosophy. Thanks, Lars. Hi, everyone. So I'm Dan Bayers. I'm the convener and the undergraduate advisor for philosophy. So that means if you have any questions about studying philosophy, you should come and ask me. So what is philosophy? It's a subject you don't always come across in high school. Um, a little bit of a spoiler, um, if you love science, philosophy is the father of science, or effectively, philosophy is the first subject, and all of the other subjects spawned out of it. Now, being first doesn't always um, mean being the best. Um, Another way of looking at it, I suppose it's the oldest, maybe the least relevant. So I'm here to explain a bit more about philosophy. Um, and you might even think, what is philosophy even doing here? This is a social sciences panel. I don't see many philosophers going out and doing, doing experiments. A few of us actually do. Um, and there's another kind of experiment, and I'll give you an example of that in a moment. It's called a thought experiment. It's a very cheap uh, kind of experiment to do, so it's quite useful. Um, but like Pat said, we care about the human element and we care about um, the certain skills that are shared through the school, like critical thinking. And um, so I believe philosophy belongs to be here. And, and uh, you know, I'd like to have a job. So what is philosophy? Uh, I think philosophy is using critical thinking, reason and logic to answer the big questions. And what are the big questions? Well, we can have a look at a few uh, in a moment. Um, spoilers for Star Wars, not necessarily one of the big questions. Who is philosophy for? Um, it's for everyone. And by everyone, I mean everyone's in, invited. And the greater the amount of diversity we have, and our student body is, is very diverse, then the better our classes go. The greater the range of opinions, the more we can all learn. And here's some photos of some philosophers. And when I said everyone, that wasn't quite right. I wanted to be you know, super welcoming. If you're not prepared to challenge your existing beliefs, including your fundamental deeply held beliefs, or if you're not prepared, if you're not brave enough to challenge society or challenge others around you in a reasoned, justified way, then maybe philosophy is not for you. Philosophy is a bit dangerous. There's a, every year someone comes in saying, man, this has really changed everything for me. And that sometimes that can be unsettling. Um, but hopefully, um, for most of you, it's just a kind of um, new moments, uh, new learning and new growth. Why is a question that we love. We love a lot of questions as philosophers. Can you smell that? It's not a favorite question. So it's not just every single question, but questions like why, they demand a justification, they demand reasons and evidence. And those kinds of questions seek, seek us out. They make us want to learn more. They make us want to investigate and challenge. And that's why I like that, that question. So you might say, well, why are we even here? Um, us 19 attendees, um, you know, we could have been still sleeping in. There's lots of things we could have been doing, yet, yet here we are. Well, I, I'd like to think that you're here because you have an amazing range of opportunities in front of you. And I'm, I'm not just talking about these four subjects, it's the whole of the university. There's so many amazing things, interesting things, useful things you can learn. So here's a picture of a bit of a smorgasbord of sweet treats. If you've got a sweet tooth, um, maybe that's more up your alley. Uh, not for the vegetarians, though, that one. Um, but my point is, you need to investigate your options. 
I don't know about my fellow panelists, but I went through several different <coughs> degrees, several different majors and minors while I was trying to find what was really interesting for me. And when I found it, it changed the way I studied. It was philosophy, I guess you could guess that. Just changed everything about how much I was learning and what I could do with it. So I do encourage you all to investigate your options. You have electives you can take. You know, you might have your degree sorted out, but there are minors that you can add in different subjects. So hopefully that's part of what we're doing here. I want you to be able to decide for yourselves, as I'm sure my fellow panelists do. So we're giving you some information, occasionally plugging our programs a little bit. So in philosophy, what are you going to learn? You're going to learn critical and creative thinking skills. Now, critical thinking skills, so how to analyze an argument, how to understand when something someone says doesn't even involve an argument, doesn't, it doesn't include any reasons why you should believe them, for example. So you don't just want to trust authority. You like, so I'm a lecturer at a university. You might think I'm an authority figure. I'm not really, but uh, if you think that, then you might think, oh, I should probably believe what he says because you know he's up there at university working away, probably doing research sometimes. But of course, I don't want you to think that. I want you to demand reasons and justifications of me, like you would of anyone else, except for the kind of small occasions where it's an emergency and you don't have time, and you know then you might want to listen to an expert without hearing the reasons. So we have a few courses that focus specifically on critical thinking. And these are ASCII 103, a lot of you might have already taken that or be enrolled in that for B semester, rights and reasons. So this is learning about the, base, the very basics of critical thinking and looking at that through the topic of rights. Now, there's also introduction to logic, which is very popular for mathematics and computer science students. The idea for logic is you're actually looking through the words that make up an argument, you're looking through those words to the structure, to the skeleton, if you like, um, underneath. And if you have a good understanding of the underlying structure of arguments that are effective or ineffective, or illogical or not, then it helps you when you go back out to the, to the big picture with all the words in to see if that argument works. And then we have another paper, fellow 103, which is critical thinking. This is available in A, B, and also should say G now, the net paper at the start of summer. And this is very skill-based. So and um, lots of students find these uh, courses difficult, but then very rewarding in the sense that when they turn to any of their other studies, they can see how this ability to think critically helps them um, sort out between the good and the bad arguments, what's actually an argument and what's not, um, no matter where they go. And so critical thinking, you might have heard a bit of a buzzword, lots of employers are interested in it. Now, I put it to you, would you like to have a job for an employer that wants you to have critical thinking skills and to exercise them on the job or not? I think all the good jobs, one of the number one things they want are critical thinking skills. You know, they also want good communicators and uh, good team players and people who are, who are honest and reliable. The critical thinking is right up there, those skills. Uh, so, for example, the rights and reasons might help you um, understand what Jacinda Ardern's saying when she says, they are within their rights to do that. That doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do. So that's the kind of thing that at first glance you might go, what? What is she saying? Uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, and it does involve rights, and it also involves the ability to work out whether or not something's an argument or not, and to analyse whether there's any reasons um, built in that to help you agree or not. In philosophy, you can also learn to challenge the laws and the morals of society. And um, so rights and reasons, you get to do a little bit of that. You're actually kind of required to do that for one of the assessments, try and write something that's challenging. And also in philosophy 106, which is social and moral philosophy, you go through a range of topics that are kind of significant to society and work out um, how can we progress in these issues. We know that people have a diverse range of views, but we also know that we need to have a way to organize this all in our diverse views to move forward and make progress with this. And how do we do that? Are there topics like um, euthanasia, discrimination, criminal justice, animal welfare, that lamb is really cute, for example, should we eat it? Um, we've also added topics recently like your online life. Are there some of the things that you do in your online life that actually you shouldn't be doing and we don't want to allow other people uh, to do? Uh, let me give you uh, an example of that in a minute. 
something else you learn in philosophy, which is to challenge your own fundamental beliefs. It's one thing to challenge society, but we probably should check in with ourselves first to make sure that we have our own house in order. So in both Philosophy 106, but also Philosophy 150, which I'm teaching at B, B semester or B trimester now, um, the big questions and introductions of philosophy. So here, every week we look at a different big question and then we try and answer those questions uh, with, with reason and, and in some subjects, the lecturers, they tell you, here's, here's the latest, here's what you've got to know. And if you can understand this, you, you'll do well. In philosophy, we say, here are some skills and some tools. Now, here are some issues that are contemporary issues. Now, let's practice straight away. Don't, you don't have to wait till third year or anything. And first year, use those tools for yourself on this topic. Debate with your, with your, your friends, your student, other students in the class. Try and work it out for yourself. The kind of questions we look at is, um, should I believe in God? Is time travel logically possible? Does my morality apply for you? Apply to you? So imagine we have different moral beliefs. And we're all being very politically correct and trying not to challenge anyone else's moral beliefs until someone comes along and says, "Well, I think it's perfectly fine to burn kittens for fun." And then we think, "Oh, no, just a think I'm not sure about that." And then. And what can we, how can we progress with that? And we talk about the meaning of life, that classic philosophical problem. You might have thought you need to wait for third year, but no, we don't talk about that in first year. Um, so I said, don't just listen to authority, ask for um, explanations, justifications. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you an example of something that we might talk about in philosophy 106, for example, it's a, an aspect of your online life. So it's also an example of a thought experiment where I feel like we can learn things all sitting down in our chairs and just thinking and discussing with each other. So here's the gamer's dilemma. Oh, I oh know that's not the gamer's dilemma. Sorry about that, if you can see that. So the gamer's dilemma is this. So um, think about, have you ever played a computer game in which you've killed someone? You know, you've committed a murder, basically, in a computer game. You've killed another an avatar, at least. So in games like Fortnite or Grand Theft Auto, okay. when I ask people in, in person, you know, the vast majority of people have done this. And I ask, was it morally wrong to kill these you know, innocent virtual people? And most people say, no, of course it's not morally wrong. We'd be doing this as a conversation now, over a different format. It's not morally wrong because you know, they're, they're not real. They're, they, may, they may be controlled by another person, but no, no real people get harmed, it's, it's totally fine. Okay, so now I ask you, how many of you have played an online game that's all about pedophilia? Just gonna assume it's no one. Um, but then we say, well, and, and why not? I wouldn't play that game because it's morally wrong. It's abhorrent, you know, I would never do that. Uh, and please don't make any judgments about me and what games I, I play based on this. This is very, very much hypothetical. But why is it the case that an online game in which minors are sexually assaulted, why is it the case that that's morally wrong? But then killing innocent people who presumably don't want to be killed online is morally permissible. Why is one horrible thing in the real world okay in a computer game and another thing that's horrible in the real world permissible in a computer game? Unless you can think of some important difference between the two, you're left in a very strange situation. The logic compels you to think that your judgment about one of those cases is wrong. And because a lot of you probably play these computer games where you kill people a lot, it might have a big impact on your life. And you might think, okay, so it's an example of how philosophy can impact your life. But there's more to it than this. As we go through these, um, thought experiments, we start to think about morality, we start to think about what really is acceptable in society or not, and why. And we get to the point where we try and trade justifications to try and see what really is the kind of thing uh, that can get a whole society to agree um, on a law or a policy. Okay, one more thing, um, you might have, I mean, I hear this a lot, just very quickly, you know, I meet people in the community and, and we it's a very common joke when they hear I'm a philosopher and they're like, oh, okay, well, you got like the one philosophy job in New Zealand, well done. You know, all those other poor philosophy graduates are, are going nowhere. 
Um, if you come and talk to me, I can tell you about this at length. I have a website that has a lot of resources on it about this. But let me just put it this way. A lot of the, the complaints are coming from older generations, the generations that think you as a student should become a medical doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, you know, these solid professions that are like, they're gonna pay, pay dividends for a long time. Um, but actually with artificial intelligence and machine learning, those jobs are gonna go. Nearly every aspect of being a lawyer and being a medical doctor and being an accountant are gonna be absorbed by machine learning and artificial intelligence. And it won't take very long for that to happen. So when those super rock steady um, professional jobs get eaten up, what's left? Well, there still needs to be people who have the critical thinking skills, the creative thinking skills, an understanding of how things relate to society, a broad knowledge, the kinds of knowledge and skills you would get from studying social sciences that have to make up the rules for the artificial intelligence and for the machine learning. So certain kinds of thinking skills and knowledge will be useful and are AI proof thinking skills. Now, a lot of the subjects where you just learn a bunch of stuff and you have to remember it, uh, that stuff changes as science advances. And so being able to learn, being able to think critically and, and being agile in your thinking, it's gonna be much more important in the future. Uh, thanks very much. I'll see you on the two I'm sure it's hard to, how much time do we have? I'm going to have to skip to 10 minutes, 10 minutes, no, I'm just going to move the phone. Okay. Okay, yes, I see Kira Tato. My name is Juan Tauri. I am um, a lecturer in the Sociology and Social Policy Program within the division, uh, and I actually teach criminology. That's my background. Okay, so I'll go through this. Okay. So the program, the Sociology and Social Policy Program, as he offers uh, papers in three interlinked subject areas, one being sociology, including criminology, uh, social policy, and gender and sexualities. So because there is three, I'm actually going to talk specifically okay, about, I can slow down now. Okay, so I've just been given the 10 signal, which is cool. Uh, because there are three, uh, distinct, if you like, subject areas. I'm actually going to focus it on sociology because that's the program I primarily teach into. And I'm going to use criminology, particularly the study of crime and deviance, as kind of an example, if you like, of the types of issues that you will be um, taught to critically analyze and think about within our program. So very, very briefly, sociology is about understanding social issues and social interactions uh, with across um, human society, groups, subcultures, and everyday life. Um, I'd like to sort of support uh, all three of my colleagues, especially Dan, and one of the, the, the focus, particularly within the criminology that I teach, is to impart to the students the ability to think critically about key social issues, right? So it's taking a magnifying glass to look at everyday activity or human conduct, like, for example, crime and deviance, so now I'm going to talk about the one area that I want to know a little bit about. Okay, so the study of crime itself and criminology actually is a sub-discipline or developed out of the sociology of deviance. And one other thing I want to focus here to, uh, to try and give you an idea of what it is to uh, think critically about key social issues is the distinction between these two interrelated categories, deviance and crime. So deviance itself is generally, uh, we define it as behaving in a way that diverges from usual or accepted social standards, especially in terms of social or sexual behaviour, okay? So the sociology of deviance, of which criminology is a part of, we are looking at issues uh, much wider than, for example, crime, okay? Because crime is an actual fact, an action or omission, which constitutes an offence and is punishable by law. So the, the category of crime which sits within deviance are those actions or behaviours okay, that the state has deemed to be uh, unacceptable and includes it in legislation such as, for example, New Zealand, the Crimes Act. Okay? And so now for a bit of fun, I'm going to show some slides and ask the question, that critical question, is it crime or is it deviance? 
just to give you an idea of sort of the complex issues that we deal with. So here we have a gentleman, I've, I've especially made sure that he was Pākehā and not Māori. That's an in-joke. Okay, now unless it is possible, of course, that what this gentleman is doing is he's gone for a power walk like I did this morning, forgot his house keys. But I think we can pretty much guess the way he's dressed, that he's burglarising Patrick's house because he's seen through the window in his lovely 56 inch TV, smart TV, okay? This is a crime under the property section of the Crimes Act, yeah? Okay. So we can accept that as, as, as a crime, although the philosopher might say, is it really? Now this is a deviant sort of crime. This is a gentleman wearing socks with sandals, okay? Which was the uh, dress, <laughs> So the clothes of choice when I was growing up in the 70s of all male teachers, including at university. Is it a crime? No. But it certainly is, would be considered a deviant act if, for example, and I'm guessing most of the people who are listening in here are probably, was it generation, what are we up to now, Z? Just about. Yeah, if one of your friends turned up for a Friday night out at a nightclub in Hamilton wearing this, they or he or she would be excluded from your group immediately. Okay, they would act as deviant in a, in a way that contravenes the social mores of your particular group. It is not a crime, or it should be, but it is certainly deviant. Okay, and this is the type of critical analysis that we're hoping that you will uh, be able to, uh, or to be taught to do here. We all of our disciplines, uh, I think, ask critical questions. Yes, political science asks, well, we, we, are, we ask the really important ones. These guys, not so much. Political science will get you to be able to answer the question, why would anyone act, uh, vote for Act Party? Uh, the geography, you'd be able to ask critical questions like, when Parker came to New Zealand, why were they so stupid that they started to build all their houses next to floodplains on major rivers? Okay, and philosophy, they're just a why question. We, in, in, in sociology, particularly in criminology, get you to think about the really important questions like, why do men wear speedos? Okay, that's my attempt at injecting humour into proceedings. But we do actually, we do actually, I actually, in Australia, doing a similar talk, I used to have a picture of then Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister in Speedos, but I was asked, and I'm not making this up by a school teacher, to take, school teacher not to have it because it was too traumatic for the students. But actually, putting humour aside, we do actually ask, I think some really significant questions. We all do. Within criminology and the sociology of deviance, we ask why it is that the vast majority of, of significant or serious gendered violence is, is done by men against women and against women that they know. Okay, why are the vast majority of those who end up in prison come from a particular group? Young men, um, brown and white, poor, etc. Okay, between the ages of around 15 to 35. Why, the, why is this the most, most criminogenic group? Okay, why do women not uh, commit so much serious crime? These are the significant issues or critical issues that we will focus on. And then we get into the real nitty gritty. Is this deviance or crime? This usually upsets a few people. It's quite complex. We have uh, uh, a mixed uh, marriage or relationship. Okay, and um, is it deviance or crime? It's certainly not a crime in New Zealand context. It was until recently, for example, in many southern states of the United uh, Southern states in America, in South Africa, and even in Australia, until around the early 1960s, with my father's generation, where it was okay for Pakia men to have sex with every woman, they just couldn't marry them. Okay. However, is it deviant? When I was 18 years old, fell in love with a young woman from a Pakia fam farming uh, community in Taranaki, when her family found out that she was going out with a Māori, they put significant pressure on her to drop me, which she did. Never got over it. <laughs> okay, so not a crime, but certainly even within my generation, okay, so in a, so certain groups, interracial relationships are an anathema. Okay. And for your generation, this is not a crime, but it definitely bloody should be. Okay, all these people stand we're walking around looking at their phones that keep walking into me as they get out of their out of the lift and I wear 100 kilos. It's just not a very safe thing to do. Okay, okay, I'm trying to rush through this. 
I'm not going to talk about specific papers. Like if you want to have a look at the type of papers that we are offering through one, years one to three, you can go into our web page and have a look at that. I want to do the plug, okay? So what uh, can, would you be able to do with a degree, for example, in sociology? A lots of things, particularly if you come and do my fantastic criminology papers. All right, a lot of our students in, in this area go into research and advocacy work in community organisations. Our students go and work also for international, uh, uh, if you like, human rights organisations. Okay, uh, a lot of our students go into even planning uh, to do social impact assessments for local government. Some go into market research, uh, and, and a lot of the students go into what I call social development, which is working for central local government agencies, generally in the sort of uh, social policy sector, okay? And of course, those who do criminology, uh, if you're this way inclined, can go into probation or, or corrections, police, social activist organisations, such, for example, as Amnesty International. Social policy, Social policy draws on a range of disciplines, such as political science, it has a very significant relationship with uh, political science and sociology, to help us understand the following. How different parts of our society, including government, provide resources and services that supposedly, or should, enhance the well-being of individuals and groups in, in our community. And also why systems of work the, the way that they do, and I mean governmental systems, health, education, employment, welfare and retirement. And I think that it also, again, want to underline, I think the core theme that's gone through our presentations of critical thinking. We get you to critically analyze these systems, all right? Analyze, question everything. Question the statements, okay, the claims that are made by policymakers, by politicians, by ministers of government about whether or not a policy, the way they're spending our money is an actual fact the best way of assisting the social development or, or providing social support, particularly to the most needy in our communities. Okay. And social policy career path is pretty much similar to the sociology one, as you can see there. I'm going to through that. Get to the end. Uh, we have this really interesting stream of gender and sexualities. Uh, which is concerned with understanding gender and gender diversity within New Zealand and the international community, uh, focused very much on key issues for women in New Zealand and internationally as well. And it does so by exploring issues like around gender roles and media representation of gender, uh, key issues around like, for example, paid and unpaid work. Uh, one of the key core issues that's been, uh, one of my colleagues is studying at the moment is this thing called the glass ceiling. Okay, why it is that in the boardrooms around New Zealand within the private sector, there's only about, I think, 50 to 20% women, and you make up 51% of the population. So these are some type of critical issues that we address. And again, the careers are often in policy analysis, women's rights research and advocacy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you to my colleagues. Thanks, Ron. Uh, there, there's a question that's come through. If you have another question, please um, um, type it in now. So the question is um, about what we're doing with our future courses and online courses. So all, all of the courses in B trimester at the University of Waikato are going to have options for doing them online, including asynchronous options, meaning if you're not there at exactly the right time, you still get to watch at least what's gone on. Um, there will also be opportunities for interaction, um, but some of those opportunities for interaction, a lot of those are going to depend on being available at exactly the right time. There's a range of different ways we're doing it, um, but for net papers, um, there's, there's going to be a range, and for hand papers, there's going to be a range as well. So if you're in another country, it shouldn't matter too much. There may be some, certain elements that uh, you can't engage with live, but there'll be a big range of elements, so you should still get a quality education. That's the plan for doing. Um, so, any other questions? <coughs> Perhaps while you're while you're, while you're banging it out, I'll just fire a quick question to Pat. Um, so, lots of people, uh, young people that I've met, seem to say, "Why should I care about politics? Because they're all corrupt and just 
how to serve themselves. It's no one worth voting for. No one represents me. So why bother? That's one view of politics. And there has been this um, well-known vlogger in New Zealand. He's a somewhat diminished force at the moment, Cameron Slater. <laughs> uh, he, had, he ran the whale oil blog, but it has been shut down a year or so ago. But he used to say, I play politics like Fijians play rugby, I'll smash your face into the ground. Which, which is a view of politics as a, as a combative, um, dog-eat-dog, dark art that um, influences how we distribute power in society. I think my view of politics is um, much more as a creative endeavour where we as uh, interested and active citizens seek to work together in creative ways to solve the critical problems that we face, like climate change, like environmental degradation, like poverty. Now, these are wicked problems that are multi-causal, that need the input from all of us. And I think the study of politics, uh, I, well, I think viewing politics in that different way uh, provides much more uh, promise for dealing with some of these critical issues. So that, that's a genuine answer to, to, what, to, what I think is a, uh, to what I think is quite a legitimate view that when someone wants to study politics, it's this dark art, and yet you know, it's often not until people do take a course that they see the potential. Thanks, Pat. Well, our time's up, so thanks very much, everyone, for tuning in. And if you do have more questions, you can just follow us up, and look us up online, or come into the campus and see us. Um, and hopefully we will see you around in Beach Remister. So thanks a lot. Cheers, guys. See you guys. <laughs>